We'll move to our third speaker, uh, um, Jeffrey Herman, who is a director d'études uh, at the Ecole Pratique des Arts d'études at the University of Paris, where he holds uh, the chair for Judaism Antique et Literature Abinique Classique. Uh, um, he's expert on the Jews of the East, especially Babylonia, and he tried to study them um, in the context of the Sasanian culture. His book, um, A Prince Without a Kingdom, the Exiliarch, um, in the Sasanian era was published in uh, 2012 by Moore Zeebuck and uh, he edited the volume on Jews, Christian and Zoroastrians, Religious Dynamics in a Sasanian Context, which was published in 2014. And he's going to talk to us about the land of Shinar conceived and bore him, the land of desire nurtured her delight. The Babylonian Talmud on Babylonian rabbinic migrants in Palestine. Please, Geoffrey. Uh, we're told in the Babylonian Talmud, uh, or the Bavli Tractate, Sukkah 20a, Sedurish uh, Lakish. Sedurish Lakish. Let me be an expiation for Rabbi Chia and his sons. For at first, when the Torah was forgotten in Israel, Ezra came up from Babylonia and we founded it. It was forgotten once again. So Hillel the Babylonian came up and reestablished it. It was forgotten once more, and Rabbi Chia and his sons came up and we founded it. In the course of late antiquity, there was a, a significant uh, elite migration of Babylonian rabbis to Palestine. Strong information networks were formed that bonded the rabbinic communities in Babylonia and Palestine. This allowed for an extensive and frequent exchange of religious tradition. Indeed, the rabbinic literature of the period, both the Jerusalem and the Babylonian Talmuds, are filled with the teachings of and accounts about Babylonian rabbis who had moved to Palestine. How did they fare in their new homeland? Very well, it would seem. The sources indicate that they were often among the most important rabbis in Palestine, whose views and participation in the Talmudic discourse is frequent, they would seem to have been very successful too. Shreer Gaon's medieval chronicle of the history of the oral law relates that the rabbis of Babylonian origin enjoyed a virtual monopoly over the leadership of the academies of, Pal of the rabbinic academies of Palestine in the third century CE. Hanina ben Chama, after uh, Rabbi, uh, that's Judah I in Sepphoris, Rabbi Elazar ben Padat, succeeding the, Babylonian, the, the Palestinian Rabbi Yochanan, uh, followed by Rabbi Ami in Tiberias. Early on, historians, too, highlighted the importance of the Babylonian migrants within the rabbinic society in Palestine and their integration into the rabbinic leadership. There is much further evidence to support this impression of the immense impact of Babylonian rabbis in the Palestinian rabbinic movement. They are the leading students of Rabbi Yochanan, one of the head rabbis of Palestine, and tradents of his teachings. When they died, they were greatly missed and eulogized eloquently in Palestine, such as the poetic words in the title of this paper, which is as follows. The land of Shinar conceived and bore him, the beauteous land uh, brought up her delight. Woe to me, said Rakat, for her precious instrument is lost. This is a new eulogy for a Babylonian rabbi who uh, came to Palestine, Rakat, a poetic name for Tiberius. However, if you examine the fate of these same rabbinic migrants in Palestine, just on the basis of the Palestinian rabbinic sources, the Jerusalem Talmud, you get a different impression, both with respect to what is said and what is missing. The Babylonian rabbinic migrants encountered difficulties in acclimatizing, in advancing. The colorful, often comic accounts of their woes are related in the Jerusalem Talmud, and they've been the focus of many studies. A recent monograph has been devoted to this topic, Going West, by Reuven Kippervasa, and earlier studies were by Saul Lieberman, Joshua Schwartz, among others. The Babylonian migrants are not the key disciples of the leading rabbis here, uh, such as Rabbi Yochanan. They are not portrayed as very close to him. And there's no indication that they were the leaders of the academies. 
the same Hanine ben Chama, is told by Rabbi that he will not give him an appointment. And there's much more. To appreciate the extent of the divergence between the two rabbinic corpora, let us look for a moment at the example of Rabbi Ami and his companion Rabbi Asi, two Babylonian migrants of the third century. They very often appear together as a pair in the Bavali, and this incidentally uh, is a Babylonian touch. They don't appear as, uh, as such in the Ushami. Rabbi Ami, not so modestly, declares in the Bavali, from me, Torah goes out to all of Israel. Rabbi Ami and Rabbi Asi together are described in the Bavli as the important priests of the land of Israel and as the judges of the land of Israel, but not so in the Jerusalem Talmud at all. Um, we have, uh, uh, according to the Babylonian Talmud, the um, appointment of these two rabbis is described uh, very uh, very nicely here. Uh, but also Rabbi Zero is a Babylonian, so we can mention that too. When the rabbis ordained Rabbi Zero, they sang before him thus, no powder and no paint and no waving of the hair and still a graceful gazelle. This is a translation of Sonsino. It captures certainly the, uh, the sense of things, if not, uh, if I haven't uh, exa exactly uh, examined the precise translation. When the rabbis ordained Rabbi Ami and Rabbi Asi, they sang before them thus, such as these, such as these ordained for, uh, for us. I did not ordain for us of the uh, perverters or the babblers or the half scholars or the one third scholars. So um, none of this is found in the Jerusalem Talmud. Uh, elsewhere, the Babylonian Talmud, they performed, they carried out the Eruv, which is a rabbinic mechanism uh, for the communal ownership of the city of Tiberias, not found in the Jerusalem Talmud. Rabbi Ami is involved with the patriarch uh, in two sources, but the Ushalmi parallels to both the patriarch sources do not include the two together. Um, for example, the Bavli has the patriarch send a firstborn animal to Rabbi Ami to inspect on the festival day. Um, and there is a detailed discussion on a legal issue. Yet, in a Yushami parallel to the same, Rabbi Ami deals with a question in the case without any mention of the patriarch. Uh, they are portrayed in the Bavli as close students of Rabbi Yochanan and transmit uh, laws, halachot, in his name. I found many cases where the parallels from the Yushami to these topics with Rabbi Yochanan do not include Rabbi Ami and Rabbi Asi, but other rabbis. In uh, the Babylonian Talmud Chulin, 103b, a long and detailed conversation between Rabbi Elazar ben Padat and Rabbi Asi uh, that highlights the close association of Rabbi Asi with Rabbi Yochanan concerning a certain halacha. The Yushami parallel to the same topic mentions Rabbi Yosei and Rabbi Yanai, different rabbis altogether. So the differences can be quite significant and affect less obvious data. Not only does the Yushami lack sources explicitly extolling the greatness of these Babylonian migrants in Palestine. But there are also more subtle distinctions worth noting, such as whether a certain rabbi is a trident of, the, uh, uh, um, of a teaching of um, another rabbi. You might have no rational reason to explain why a tradition is transmitted in the Ushami by Rabbi X and in the Bavli by Rabbi Y, but we seem to discern a pattern here, whereby the Bavli prefers its own Babylonian migrants in Palestine. The Bavli links their rabbis in Palestine with the patriarchate, with the civic authority, uh, or as the rabbis reporting the teachers of the leading Palestinian rabbis. So clearly, the Babylonian Talmud reflects a bias of its own and advances a sense of superiority for the Torah to uh, scholarship from Babylonia over that native in Palestine. And many have written about this, including my teacher, uh, Shai Gafni. Shuragon was a Babylonian nationalist involved in his own competition with the rabbinic centers in Palestine of his own times. Naturally and transparently, he promoted the superiority of Torah learning in Babylonia over its Palestinian rival. This is reflected in his selection of sources. However, the image he provides is drawn directly and accurately from the Babylonian Talmud. Until two or three decades ago, it was still common to find historical accounts of rabbinic history in Palestine freely incorporating data from both Talmuds without too much reference uh, for one over the other. Constructing historical, biographical, 
halachic accounts from the mix of the accumulated whole. Scholars today are uh, usually more critical and recognize the bias of the sources. While every source has its issues, it is evident that when speaking about figures and events in Palestine, we are closer to the truth when focusing on the Palestinian contemporary sources. So some scholars writing on the history of Palestine today avoid reference completely to the Babylonian Talmud. Others include references often just in the notes, hesitantly and some, somewhat apologetically. Now, however, with an awareness of the fundamental unreliability of Babylonian sources for the actual history of the rabbinic society within Palestine, such sources for us must have another purpose. They inform us about Palestine as an idea, as a tool. This is the rabbinic Palestine of the Babylonian Talmud that I shall now uh, continue talking about. Palestine serves a number of purposes for the rabbis of the Babylonian Talmud. So I shall review three broad categories here. It uses Palestine to confirm the supreme quality of Babylonian Torah study and Babylonian rabbis. This is well known. The Rav Kahana story is all about that. This is a story of a, a young Babylonian student who runs away to Palestine, enters the, the academy of Rabbi Yochanan, the greatest scholar, and defeats him in an academic duel. Um, in uh, Babylonia, we hear much praise of Babylonian rabbis attributed to uh, Palestinian uh, sages. Um, one example, um, Rav Huna, the Babylonian Rav Huna, would teach with 13 Amoraim or assistants when the rabbis, uh, um, when the rabbis um, would get up from his academy and shake their cloaks, the dust would rise up to the sky. They would say in the West, that is in Palestine, they've arisen from the Academy of Rav Huna, the Babylonian. In uh, Palestine, the tradition I began with uh, on the Babylonians arriving in Palestine to restore the Torah is itself attributed to a Palestinian rabbi, Reish Lakish. Proximity, as I've mentioned, to the most important rabbis in Palestine. They receive their ordination from them, such as from a rabbi, and are portrayed as close to, to them. They subsequently acquire leadership positions. Uh, this is all about using Palestine to promote Babylonia. Um, the eulogies. Um, we encounter uh, the reception of the deceased Babylonian uh, rabbis brought to Palestine for burial. Uh, for example, um, uh, When they would hear about somebody uh, um, who dies here in Babylonia, they mourned for him there in Tiberias as follows. Great was he in Sheshach. Sheshach, uh, a poetic term for Babylonia. And he has a name in Rakat, as I mentioned, a poetic name for Tiberias. Um, and when the coffin is taken there, they mourn for him thus. Ye lovers of the remnants, uh, dwellers in Rakat, go forth and receive the slaughtered of the depths. And each word here is a poetic uh, term, um, as is in the custom of, uh, of poetry of the time. And another of this type, this is from a Carmeli's uh, edition. Um, the seal of an ancient stock has come from Babylonia together with the Book of Wars of the Lord. Both vulture and raven rush to see this ravage and ruin, which has come from Shinar. When he raged... At his world, he plundered souls, then delighted in them as in a new bride. He who rides upon the highest heaven rejoices and exults when the souls of the righteous come to him. And this is a, a poem found in the Babylonian Talmud of a Babylonian scholar who has been brought uh, to Palestine for burial. Um, these poems, all of them, they all come from the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, the poetic art form reflected in them itself which is well developed, as Awan Mirsky has, uh, for, has, has uh, shown, for example, would seem to be Babylonian. Um, even though they're portrayed as if they are composed in Palestine, they would seem to be Babylonian literary products and not, the Babylonian, not Palestinian ones. Uh, a second uh, category, the Bavli uses Palestine to assert the importance of rabbis more generally. Um, and uh, I've discussed this elsewhere in the example of, uh, of uh, Rabbi Abahu of Caesarea. This uh, Palestinian rabbi 
uh, as an example, is portrayed as close to the palace and highly influential. This is not confirmed in the Palestinian sources, but reflects the way the Babylonian rabbis would like to imagine a rabbi being regarded. And the third category, the rabbi Bavli uses Palestine to advance values dear to the rabbinic thought uh, of, um, of Babylonia. And this is a much larger and more complex matter. It involves some nuance. Also, it is not always clear that the Bavli is deliberate or fully conscious of what it is doing. The source material is diverse and not limited to the explicit references with which I began. Also, I, will, I do not at all claim here to be uh, doing more than alluding, perhaps the tip of the iceberg, to the wealth of material that might be adduced to make this argument here. I mentioned then just two uh, examples, one well-known and the other I believe to be new. Uh, exemption from taxation for rabbis, and, and rabbinic disciples, and uh, feeding of uh, disciples as something very unique. The, um, dis the discussion uh, in the Bavli on the question of the Palestinian Nasi um, not exempting rabbis from participating in the construction of the Wall of Babylonia uh, appears in the source here in the Babylonian Talmud. Um, and it's discussed by Michael Sattler in an article from some years ago. Uh, let me just read the source. Uh, Rabbi Yehuda Nasia levied a tax for the wall on the rabbis. Reish Lakish said to him, Rabbis do not need guarding, as it is written. I count, I count them. They exceed the grains of sand. Uh, to whom does this refer? To the righteous, who themselves are more numerous than sand. Um, now about all Israel it is written... Um, I bestow my blessing upon you and make your descendants as numerous as the sands of the seashore. While they read it thus, I count them, the deeds of the righteous, they exceed the grains of the sand. Um, and, uh, and then he, he continues a little more, and there's a bit more discussion on this topic. The next uh, continuation of this source moves to Babylonia. Rav Nachman Bar uh, Rav Chista levied attacks on the rabbis. Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak said to him, you transgress uh, this action, uh, you transgress the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Um, and then he brings proof texts to support that. And uh, so we have a, a detailed um, uh, discourse here, a detailed um, argument against taxation of the rabbis. It starts with a source from Palestine concerning the patriarch, the Nasi, and then moves on to, to issues in, uh, in Palestine. Uh, Michael Sattler argued that it's not historical. The theme is Babylonian. It appears only in the Bavli. One can say that the Bavli appeals to Palestinian rabbis to advance opinions in support of their agenda, exemption from municipal taxation. The involvement of the Nasi might suggest that their opponent in Babylonia is the Babylonian Nasi, that is, the Exilarch. And this records, uh, it recalls another source from the uh, Babylonian Talmud Sanhedrin 7b, which presents itself also as a Palestinian source, critiquing the appointment of judges by the Nasi on the basis of wealth and not wisdom. There is a Palestinian parallel this time, but it does not refer to the Nasi at all. Um, again, one needs uh, to re-examine the Palestinian reality on the basis of the Palestinian sources alone and ask whether the Bavali is telling us something about its own problems uh, with, the pro with the appointment of, of judges. Again, perhaps the ex is the target. The uh, second, uh, the second um, um, example I wanted to bring here has to do with the topic of uh, um, elementary support for the rabbis or for the students of the rabbis, feeding them and describing this fee feeding as in some way um, replacing or continuing uh, uh, the sacrificial cult of the temple. This is something that, um, that comes up um, in the Babylonian Talmud, in um, eight different sources, or ten sources and two are repeated, it doesn't appear at all in the uh, Palestinian sources. Um, it is presented, for the most part, in the Babylonian Talmud as if these are Palestinian sources. Yet we don't have parallels, and uh, sometimes we do have parallels with other Babylonian sources. I would argue here that what we do have is the Babylonian Talmud promoting a certain agenda on the back of Palestine, uh, providing it with uh, some kind of uh, um, authority and, and making it. I'll show you the sources now. Um, that's 
So, okay, so these are the sources that we have. Um, um, uh, as I said, all from the Babylonian Talmud here. Whoever brings a gift to a disciple of the sages, it's as if he's offering first fruits. That's uh, uh, the first one. The second one is a story which involves uh, um, uh, a story uh, of a person bringing a gift to a rabbi, then calling it first fruits. Rav Anan bought, uh, bought whatever the, uh, the, um, uh, 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 the whatever he bought before the rabbi um, gave him a gift, and then, asked, and then he also had a legal issue. He wanted the rabbi to judge him, and so the rabbi uh, doesn't agree to judge his uh, legal case. And then, uh, the, then the uh, person says, "Are you going to prevent me from providing you with uh, first fruits?" And he provides his uh, his proof text there. Um, and, but and, and with an argument that says that um, he whoever brings a gift to the cycle of the sages, it's as if he is offering first fruits. And uh, and that's the second source here. Here we have um, um, Rabbi Yossi, the son of uh, Rabbi Hanina, in the name of Rabbi Elias Ben Yaakov, said, whoever hosts a disciple of the sages in his home and provides him uh, with his possessions, it's as if he is offering the daily sacrifice, the tamid. The fourth example here, whoever fills the throat, this is my favorite, whoever fills the throat of the disciples of the sages with wine, it's as if he libated wine on the altar. That's for Purim. And um, the, uh, the next one we have here, Rabbi Yochanan said, all the prophets prophesied only with respect to rewards coming, uh, becoming one who marries his daughter to a disciple of the sages and who works to benefit a disciple of the sages and who benefits a sage from his possessions but for the sages themselves, uh, and he carries on. Uh, the last uh, example here, Rabbi Nehemiah um, began um, a, a meeting uh, of sages in honor of the inn and taught uh, one who hosts the disciple of the sage within his house and feeds and provides him with drink and benefits him from his possessions, uh, etc. How much more so is he to be uh, praised? So we have here a series of uh, traditions, all in the Babylonian Talmud. Some of them are presented anonymously, but within the, with, the, with the introductory formula of a, Babylon, of a Palestinian tradition. And some of them in the names of, Babylon, of sorry, Palestinian rabbis. Um, now, we don't have the parallels. Sometimes we have a partial parallel. Now, what is interesting here is that when we do have a partial parallel, it's a little bit different. Uh, we have some examples. Um, um, here, no, this we've seen. No, this is, uh, oh, there were eight, and this is the last two. So let's just quickly look at these two as well. Whoever benefits from a meal in which the disciple of the sages is present, it's as if he's enjoyed the splendor of the divine uh, presence. And the final one here, uh, Rabbi Yossi, son of Abin, said, uh, um, um, he who uh, puts money into the pocket of the disciples of the sages, as Rabbi Yochanan said, whoever puts money into the pocket of the sages, merits to sit at the academy on high. As it is said, for in the shade of wisdom is the shade of money. Okay, now the uh, Babylonian and, and Palestinian Talmuds provide uh, similar things, but with a difference. So the one that we just saw with the, with the text, uh, uh, for in the shade of wisdom uh, in the shade, is the shade of mo- in the shade of money, we have in the Jerusalem Talmud, we have a similar text. Rabbi Chana said, Rabbi Jeremiah said in the name of Rabbi Chia, the Holy One, blessed be he, will in the future make shade for the doers of commandments in the shade of Torah scholars. What is the verse? In the shade of wisdom, the shade of money. A reward for the uh, doers of commandments, those who, uh, who obey the commandments, but not scholars and, uh, and not the same uh, story at all. Uh, um, <clears throat> Another example of a comparison where the same idea but with a difference in the Jerusalem Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud says, whoever brings a gift to a disciple of the sages, it's as if he, is offered, as if he offers first fruits. For the uh, Leviticus Rabbah, that's a midrash in Jerusalem uh, Talmud, we have Rabbi Isaac and bring the poor uh, wanderer shelter, the ver- verse. Then Rabbi Abin said, if you acted so, I count it for you as if you brought first fruits to the temple. It says here, bring, and it says further on, the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of your Lord, etc. 
the point here is that for the uh, Palestinian sources, giving money to the poor is like giving first, first fruits to the temple. For the Babylonian Talmud, it's giving money to the sages, to the disciples of the sages, in order for them to, uh, uh, to, to study. So we have here um, a whole series of traditions that the Babylonian Talmud introduces, introduces as, as if they are Palestinian uh, uh, traditions, but we don't have parallels in the Palestinian sources, and we also do have differences to suggest that perhaps in, Babylon, in Palestine they, are, they think differently. This, I believe, is an example of how um, the Babylonian Talmud uses, um, uses uh, Palestine to promote an agenda, a certain agenda. Here, when I think of, the, uh, of the, what the Babylonian Talmud is thinking about, it's imagining the disciple of the sages like a temple who is receiving offerings, who is receiving sacrifices. Uh, this reminds me of what the Manichaeans were doing a little bit, but, uh, but certainly it doesn't have uh, an equivalent in Palestine. So, uh, in conclusion, the view, from, the view of Palestine from Babylonia is opaque. What they see is what they want to see, and in many ways it's an extension of themselves, but it's not always the same as Babylonia either. Uh, but epitomizes in many aspects what the Babylonian rabbis would like Babylonia to be, a form of utopia. Babylonia then needs Palestine to support, confirm, and fabricate its achievements and greatness. And this relationship between Babylonia and Palestine is not mutual. The rabbinic migrants from, Pal from Babylonia are imagined to have become the greatest scholars of Palestine and have acquired leadership positions within the rabbinic hierarchy. Palestine in the Babylonian imaginaire, welcomes Babylonian scholarship, recognizes its promise, depends upon it, and honors it. Palestine then functions for Babylonia as a vital other to affirm its position and importance in Torah and, uh, and others of its values. But it also functions as a tool to promote Babylonian creativity, which it introduces under the guise of being Palestinian and so authentic and early. Uh, this is merely part of a broader trend within the Bavli, attested throughout the Babylonian Talmud. The Bavli consciously and subconsciously evokes Palestinian imagined and genuine teachings to affirm and advance uh, positions held by the Bavli, either uh, whether in halakha or culture. Um, Palestinian traditions are, are consistently reformulated, uh, reinterpreted, revised, and sometimes reinvented to conform with, with Babylonian concerns. The task of the historian of the Talmud is to catch them in the act. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey, for a lecture that took us to a different space. Um, please. Um, um, thanks. I have, a, I have a question um, kind of from the point of view of mobility. Um, and, and it seems to me that there are two kind of very different parts of your lecture. Right? The first part, you, you speak about the, kind of the stories about the reception of the Babylonians in the land of Israel. So clearly we have mobility here. And, and you spoke about the, kind of the, basically about the Babylonian part of it. Um, in other words, they, they all get really recept received very well in, in, in the land of Israel to reflect, to kind of establish your own position. So, so that, that was clear. Um, the, the main point about your paper, however, seemed to have been about these other traditions, um, about very much about the sages and the kind of the reinterpretation. And here my question is then, so how, how does that reflect on the mobility? Is, is the main point there that the, that, the, that the traditions moved from the land of Israel to Babylonia and in the process of it were reinterpreted? Or is that, or did you choose the topic of the sages because you think, because there is also something about the, kind of implied perhaps about the status of the Babylonian uh, sages in, in those stories that got reinterpreted? Do, do you see what I mean? Um, I'll, um, uh, the, um, 
it's a selection of what I what I chose to 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 give, and uh, and it's all true. I mean, we have an enormous number of names of Babylonian rabbis who moved to Palestine, yes. and we have an enormous amount of tradition uh, that was transmitted in both directions. The the, the, uh, the uh, and and uh, and uh, I didn't want to, I didn't talk today about the stuff that's transmitted uh, um, reliably. And, uh, and and accurately, and that that's that, that that's less interesting to me at the moment, and and so so uh, so I'm so I'm dealing with with both with both both factors, the fact the fact of um, of uh, what we um, uh, what Palestine means to each tradition, um, uh, the migrants in Palestine have been dealt with in a book recently, as you know, and so. I, I don't want to talk about that now. That's that's uh, that's been done. So um, so I talked about the other side. I think that's uh, that's been much less spoken about. Um, the uh, the reality of, of of these migrants who arrived in Palestine is is a fascinating topic in itself. The um, but it's it's not completely clear what uh, what what your question. No, so um, I, I just want, maybe I'm and, and just say, can you just highlight the, 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 the connection to, to the topic of mobility and, and the importance of Palestine versus Babylon in, in this exchange? I mean, is, is, is the, the, the reference to the um, Palestinian rabbis um, crucial in the, in the Babylonian version of it? Um, if we assume that they were perhaps also similar traditions were also transmitted without the Palestinian tag on it, or? It's important for the Babylonian channel to have that, but the Pal Palestine is critical. Yeah. Uh, that's what I want to say. Yeah, Palestine is absolutely critical for the Babylonian Talmud, um, for, the, uh, for their um, uh, self-consciousness, for, yeah. um, for their ability to, uh, to promote certain ideas that, uh, that they, uh, that, they, that that they want to advance, which are not necessarily what they're receiving, um, and sometimes it's conscious. And, and there, there, are, there are examples in both of both directions, where the things are, are subtle and where the things are very, very clearly deliberate. Um, and I also believe there's a lot that's subconscious. Um, um, that's how they see it because of where they come from and f from what they know. Uh, so that's what I would say. Questions? You seem to be tired. <laughs> if there are no more questions, I should like to thank our three speakers and.